This week on Tequila Sunrise, we cast off the lines and sail to the wind. And you're about to be blown away by the second half of Ben Gordon's interview. Learn how Ben Gordon brings value to the supply chain ecosystem, how he values companies, and how he values the contributions of their founders. You can learn a lot from Ben. So, listen up. It's time to wake up to Tequila Sunrise, where unfortunately, without the aid of tequila, we open your eyes to how venture investing ticks focused on supply chain tech every single week at this unholy hour of the day. If you want a taste of how tech startup growth and investment is done, join me every week for another blinding Tequila Sunrise. Greg White here from Supply Chain Now. I am always happy, never satisfied, willing to acknowledge reality but refusing to be bound by it. My goal is to inform, enlighten, and inspire you in your own supply chain tech journey. Hey, if you are listening on SoundCloud, you should know you can only subscribe to Tequila Sunrise on apps like Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or others, and be notified when we pour out another shot. Subscribe to Tequila Sunrise today so you don't miss a thing. Here we go into the second half with Ben Gordon. Listen up. Look, it's good to be, it's good to be smart. It's better to be lucky. And, and we were lucky. Uh, because, well, in 2010, a guy that a lot of people had never heard of in logistics showed up and his name was Brad Jacobs. And he said, hey, you probably don't know me, but I've done four roll-ups in other industries and I've decided my next industry is going to be in logistics. Hmm. And I hear you guys know a lot about logistics. Maybe you can help me. We ended up working together, helped him think through some of the opportunities from a strategy acquisition standpoint, and then ultimately put some money in with Brad in the formation of what would become XPO. And of course, Brad took a, a small platform called Express One that was doing 10 million of EBITDA and grew it into what's now about a $16 billion value public company. And so, right. and that, that represented a lot of the things that we looked for, a fantastic CEO, a high growth plan, uh, a business that had, had a moat around, the, the moat really was frankly, more about Brad and his strategy and the acquisitions, but also a very aggressive investment in technology. You know, he's spending $400 million a year now in technology, but right. he's got a $16 billion business. But what's less obvious is at the time when he bought Express One, he took it from $10 million of EBITDA down to cash flow negative because he put all this overhead in. A lot of people thought that was crazy. Well, in hindsight, it wasn't crazy at all. He was investing in the future by investing in technology and investing in people that would make it possible to build something much bigger. And so it, it said that success has a thousand fathers and a lot of people will claim that they, they were an important part of the success and that the success was preordained and it was obvious. It was not obvious at the time. Yeah. <laughs> and, well, and I know that you humbly say that you only played a small part there, but I think it was a pretty critical part. Also pre-COVID, just weeks or months before and this is a Brad term that I have coined, this seismic societal disruption, he was contemplating divesting that company because he felt like it wasn't as valuable as it could be for the shareholders because the company was rolled up. The blend of valuations was actually less than some of those companies would have been valued if they were standalone or their own entity, right? That's right. That's right. So there, I mean, there is still incredible value in XPO. Well, right? I remain a shareholder today as I was nine years ago. So I, I'm voting with my wallet. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree. that's right. Exactly. Yeah. So for, for me, so that was how Cambridge started. XPO was a fantastic uh, original investment. Um, another was a company called Grand Junction. And Grand Junction was a company in e-commerce and last mile logistics technology. Rob Howard, who is the founder, great guy had sold his prior company in Senda to Transforce and was going to go do it again with a focus on the tech side. He came to me and said, and this is always a great pitch, 
I don't need money, but I'd love to have you involved and I'd love your help. And, you know, the, the premise was that he was going to use technology to help solve the last mile problem, which would be very valuable for retailers competing against Amazon, right. also very valuable for logistics companies. And Rob thought that maybe we could help with the strategy, with access to potential customers, and then thoughts on who the eventual buyers would be and how to get there. You know, Rob was, uh, was, was generous enough that he said, look, I'll let you earn some equity in addition to whatever you buy, be my partner and help, help me do this. And hmm. look, Rob's the founder, Rob's the CEO, Rob deserves all the credit, but I played a little role in those areas. And we helped with, with you know, thoughts in each of those elements and brought Rob to our annual conference, which is something that Rob really wanted to be a part of. And, and it was great because you know we have 250 plus CEOs and leaders of supply chain companies that come to our, it's an invitation only event at the breakers in Palm Beach. It's a, you know, <laughs> CEO of one company calls it the, the Davos of logistics. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, um, so <laughs> we brought Rob to the event. We introduced him to the CEOs and heads of logistics of a string of major companies, including XPO, Purelator, YRC, a variety of others. People loved what he was doing. Uh, things took off. And guess what? Two years later, Target came in we made an offer that we couldn't refuse and that Rob right. couldn't refuse. And we sold the business. And that was that was a 30X. It was fantastic. Yeah. But what's important to note about that was it didn't just happen. I mean, there was a tremendous amount of work and preparation. And again, Rob is the one who spearheads that. And Rob is the one who deserves the credit. And I will tell you that when, when Rob came to us and said, hey, what do you think we should do? You know, Target's made this offer. Um, what I said to Rob was, look, You've built a great business. I think it'll continue to grow. You'll continue to succeed. And I believe the business will be worth more next year than it is right now. Having said that, I also think you've earned the right to get to make that decision because you created this value. I didn't create it. You were right. the founder and CEO. And you know that, that's a really important part of what I think the relationship should be with a founder. And if you are a founder first fund, as we are, you start by asking the question, well, who created this value and what does he or she think? And, you know, I asked Rob, I said, look, Rob, you know, there's a lot of money on the table. Do you want to take this offer? And, you know, it, Rob wanted to take it. And so we said, great, we support you. Let's go make it happen. And, yeah. and that's exactly what happened. That's an interesting story. Not And not a name like some of the other names you've mentioned that everybody knows. But I recall when that transaction happened, because that was a that was a game changer, an overused term, sort of like disrupted. But that was a game changer for Target and their ability to deliver e-com. And it's, it has continued to bring value to that organization. I'm curious, when I think about specialists in industries, it's very rare. Are you the only growth equity, private equity firm that focuses solely on supply chain or are there others or I know there are some who have supply chain in their in their thesis but do you know of others I think we're unique I think there are other smart people that invest in logistics and supply chain most of them are generalists they're big funds that have a group for industrials and a group for healthcare and a group for energy and then a group for transportation and logistics whatever. yeah and guess what um, as you alluded to earlier on, uh, most people don't grow up dreaming of being in supply chain. And if you are at a, one of those large funds and you're a rising star at that fund, you're probably in healthcare or tech or some other area that's not logistics. And supply. Right. That's right. That's a good so, point. No, no offense to those people, but you know, the, the, the truth is that's just, that, that's how it is. Those are those are large markets and they're growing markets and they've produced more billionaire, you know, investors and founders and people go where the money is. Right. So, uh, so there are lots of people who invest in supply chain. I believe we're unique in being the only growth capital and buyout firm focused exclusively on supply chain. Okay. Um, there are specialists again, there are, I mean, there are some venture firms that, that, that do predominantly supply chain early stage, you know, particularly. Yeah. Um, as you know, and, and uh, there are a couple of others, but, but, but for growth capital and buyouts, yeah, I, th I think we're unique. But I think where we're really unique is 
the operational team that we have. So we have a set of operating partners and they're people who have built fantastic companies. I mean, Remus Kapesk has built the UPS Strategic Enterprise Fund. You know him, he's in Atlanta, ran right. R&D for UPS. Dave Stubbs, who's a partner, not just an operating partner, built the Kuninago Lee Logistics business. Isa Alsala, who built Agility Logistics and was someone that I was privileged to work closely with 16 years ago when we worked with Agility on their M&A strategy and string of acquisitions. Um, Isa built Agility from really a, a tiny uh, one country warehousing company to a $5 billion value public company, Agility. Um, you know, fantastic, right? So yeah. people like Isa, Remus, and Dave, because of their success building, you know, those examples, multi-hundred or multi-billion dollar value businesses, they really understand supply chain. They really understand what it takes to scale. And that means that the entrepreneurs that we back and the management teams that we support, they don't just get money, they get real help. Yes. And that's a huge differentiator. I mean, I have to say that when I was building Threeplex and my investors included all these big names, you know, no disrespect to Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Bank Boston Ventures, but the the investors from those firms and those funds really didn't understand supply chain and really didn't get involved in my business in a meaningful way. And, you know, I had an investor, CNF Ventures, which became Conway, which ironically is now part of XPO. Uh, and they didn't even have a board seat because their investment was so small. I think they put in 500 grand out of the 28 million that we raised, but they, they had observer status and they spent time helping me on the business and, and it made an impact. And yeah. I wanted to be more like those guys in that I, I, I wanted to be able to really help our portfolio companies. And the best way to do that is with a team of partners who have built major companies. So have I built a multi-billion dollar company? No, but I've got partners that have. And having that access really, really makes a difference. So I think having the combination of strategy, technology, finance, and operational experience in supply chain, it, it really helps the portfolio companies. It does. And you know, you and I know, but maybe our listeners don't know that that is a common refrain. We're operators, right? And operators generally means generally operators. And for someone to have operators like Remus, right, or like Dave or, or Issa, who can actually contribute value to the business, that is a very, very rare thing. As, as I love to tell, you know, I've dealt with the occasional venture capitalist or, or growth equity firm. Um, what I love to tell them is your differentiator is exactly like everyone else that I talk to, right? Your operators, or you can help with the business or, or, or whatever. But in, in your case, I mean, the thing that I see is whether it is tech or whether it is physical asset based or even non asset based transportation and logistics, you have actual experience and actual people who can engage and really, really offer uh, assistance to the organizations. To me, that's one of the values that I see when I, when I look at Cambridge in particular. Well, so uh, let me let me shift gears to the future a little bit because you get to see a lot of what's going on, and I'm, and so everyone knows you don't, as they can probably tell by these names, but I feel compelled to say this: you don't invest only in supply chain tech. Obviously, you invest in physical and non-physical asset, or as you said, mode type organizations. But I'm interested, particularly on the tech side. What are you seeing in the market now? What do you kind of expect into the future? And what complexities or almost hidden issues do you do you think we you you have eyes on or or we might discover in the near or distant future? Well, I think one huge theme is the growth of importance of last mile. As we, we've all entered into month six of of work from home and this this COVID landscape that's reshaped everything. The rise of e-commerce and the rise of logistics that supports e-commerce, mm -hmm. of course, is a macro theme that, that is indisputable. It's worth noting that in the first month after COVID, the penetration rate of e-commerce was effectively equal to, I think, two years of, of increase in penetration pr prior to that. Almost exactly that. That's right. 36% and it was growing at about 18% previously. That's right. Yeah. So, so it compressed a lot into a short period and, and that, that has several ripple effects. Okay. So one is 
growth in last mile. The e-commerce growth requires somebody to actually deliver the goods. So that has I've a heard that. Yeah, how about that? Right. <laughs> they don't just show up uh, uh, magically. So not yet. <laughs> it's coming. Actually, if you look at patents, you'll notice that companies like Walmart and Amazon uh, are are submitting patents for things like drone delivery of, of goods, and mm -hmm. there, there's going to be more and more automation. But 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 I digress. The primary point is one: the growth in e-commerce. Two: the resulting growth in supply chain to support e-commerce. Three: what that means for last mile services, for last mile technology, uh, five e-commerce fulfillment, uh, six robotics in the warehouse, uh, seven drones uh, for, for the actual delivery. And then eight, the, the opportunities to use analytics to just improve and automate other elements of the supply chain. So all those things are happening. And so the first domino leads to all, all those others you know, be, being knocked down. And so what does that mean? Well, first of all, growth in last mile. That's why we've invested in companies like Bring. Bring has been a fantastic company. Uh, it's doubled or, or more than doubled every year since we first invested four years ago. We've continued to put more in, put in you know, close to 20 million now. And Bring has done a fantastic job because they really understood that last mile was important. It was important for brands. It was important for companies that are worried about Amazon and worried about the right. growing market power and the fear that every brand has, which is that they are being reduced uh, to a commodity that's on Amazon that can be replaced by you know by by somebody else that's that's uh, favored by Amazon or even an, an in-house you know private label right. uh, of Amazon. So right. so last mile logistics and technology, the way Bring sees sees it, is a way for those brands to fight back and protect themselves. And so and that's something that we saw with Grand Junction, and we know how valuable and powerful that is. And that's something that that, that we're seeing you know drive success for Bring. Lyft, it's another example of that. It's a company that's using technology to help automate last mile, particularly in Latin America, which is where they're based. And in major markets like Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, they're, uh, they're, they're really emerging as a powerhouse, tremendous growth, you know, uh, over 4X growth last year and, and continuing to do a great job this year. Fantastic entrepreneurial management team, customers that seem to really love them. Again, they're, they're bringing automation to a market that's increasingly important because of the rise of e-commerce and, and, and that, that you know, fits that theme. Some of these other areas, e-commerce fulfillment, it's interesting. For me, 3Plex 21 years ago, we actually had an initiative that we called the ship it button, uh, which really was, okay, what happens after you click buy it, then what? And right. we, we, had, we, we had the right idea, but we were trying to do too much at once. And as, as most entrepreneurs learn the hard way, uh, doing more than one thing well uh, usually means that you won't do anything well. And yeah. so we did not succeed with the ship it button then, uh, but we see lots of companies today in e-commerce fulfillment that are, that are succeeding and, and lots that are, you know, that are, that are interesting to us. And we haven't picked one yet, but, you know, but, but we will. Um, so I think that's an important area of opportunity. Robotics, look, robotics in the warehouse uh, is an exciting area. It's an yeah. area that has captured a, a fair amount of, of press. You know, just, just yesterday, there was, there was an announcement of, of a company that, that's launching exoskeletons uh, for, for industrial yes. sizes. I uh, saw that. Robotics. Iron Man in the warehouse. I can't wait for that. Right? Exactly. Tony Stark didn't think he was going to be a warehouse operator, but, but you know what? That maybe, maybe that's where the adoption will come. And, yeah. and what's interesting about that is... Um, exoskeletons originally were developed for the military as, right. as a way to, to, to give uh, our troops a more pr protection and be more strength uh, so that, look, I mean, if, if you could operate, you know, in, in the field of combat and run twice as fast as the other guys or lift twice as much or jump twice as high, I mean, you know, there are, there are all kinds of, of amazing advantages. But who would have thought that something as prosaic as lifting bo heavy boxes in a warehouse would, would prove to be uh, an important area of adoption. But it is. And the reason yeah. it is, is self-evident because as e-commerce fulfillment grows and as logistics uh, becomes more important and as expensive warehouses continue to get built in major cities, because if you want that 
toothpaste delivered on a same day basis and you're living in Atlanta, guess what? It's got to come from a warehouse in Atlanta. You can't be fulfilling from somewhere 500 miles away and expect to be able to do same day. So that means that real estate's more expensive. Well, if the real estate's more expensive, uh, you got to find a way to sweat the assets and create more productivity. So robotics and automation in the warehouse is one way to do that. Uh, so that's that's coming. Uh, you know, like I said, drones another area of, of application. So I think all these are examples of change that that we see at the intersection of logistics, supply chain, and technology. And those are what create opportunity that we're excited about. That's really interesting because I think not to go back to COVID, I have to, I'm sorry, I just did it. One of the things that COVID has brought to us is this recognition that at least in the short term, we're going to have to have exceptional spacing between human beings in a distribution center. Also, because because uh, cleaning is so important. And now there are robots that can clean off shift between shifts, as well as help help or conduct some of the work that humans have done in the past. And we've seen the model work with, you know, the usual suspect, Amazon, who uh, really pioneered that with the Kiva system that, that they bought. And we've seen some systems that are far more advanced than that hit the market since that time as well. So there is definitely a need. There's definitely an opportunity. And now with the possibility of reshoring or nearshoring, we can't duplicate either in manufacturing or in distribution and possibly not even in retail. We can't duplicate the size of workforce that China has if we want to have any hope of being able to reshore or nearshore that work. It's going to have to be at a substantially lower cost than it takes to pay human beings to do that. So just my thought on that is robotics, they do the grunt work and humans do the more ethereal and exceptional work. And, and we elevate humans away from the, the repetitive, the mundane, the dangerous and other aspects that those robotics can take on. And it sort of elevates the entire supply chain as, you know, supply chain is, is as much a mind function now as it is a physical function. So it's, it's an interesting transition. Those are great insights. I really appreciate that. So, all right. So let me shift gears a little bit. I want, uh, I want to get an idea from you for maybe some of our founders or execs or even other investors. What can they do better? Or, or if there were a couple of takeaways for our listeners from what we've talked about at this point, what do you think are the most important takeaways for somebody who is either operating or investing or building technology for supply chain? Well, I think the, the number one takeaway is make sure you're focusing on solving an important problem. You know, I, I've, I've looked at a lot of companies where they've got smart people and they're working really hard, but they're just not solving the most important problem. And you know what, you're going to do the work to figure something out. You might as well do it in an area where if you're right, the upside is much bigger. So solve a big problem. Think about the big themes like the growth in e-commerce and the logistics that supports it, or the growing importance of cross-border, or the growing importance of consolidation or convergence of multiple services. Like These are all big themes. And if you get the big themes right, and then make sure that you're solving a big problem or a big need that, that dovetails with that and supports that, great. I mean, that's, so I think to me, number one, solve a big problem. Yep. Number two is make sure everybody in your organization knows what's the metric that matters most. I've seen this a lot too. Look, if you're looking at a logistics company, and there are a lot of logistics companies today that are masquerading as tech companies. And you know, they think, oh, well, I should be worth a revenue multiple because that's what these other tech companies are. If you're a logistics company, you're not going to be valued on a revenue multiple. You're going to be valued on EBITDA. So if that's what you are, own it, embrace it, focus on maximizing EBITDA. On the other hand, you know, if you are a SaaS uh, recurring revenue you know, software company, great. You're going to get measured as a multiple of, of, of your SaaS revenue. And the higher, the, you could almost think of it as a scatter plot, you know, where the x-axis is the SaaS revenue and the y-axis is the growth rate. And, and based on where you are in the scatter plot, it, it tells you where to be. So just know what's the metric that matters yep. uh, and what you're focused on. And it's not just a numbers issue. It's also a strategy issue, right? But know what to focus on. 
Um, number three is <laughs> don't be penny wise and pound foolish. You know, it was interesting. I, I've seen lots of companies where venture backed is different, but if you're a founder led company and you haven't brought in institutional money, maybe you've got options for your management team, maybe you don't. You can unlock tremendous value when you provide that additional equity upside for your team. By the way, an interesting deal that was in the news yesterday, uh, the Nikola uh, Motor business, which just announced a partnership with and a $2 billion investment from GM. Uh, and they're public and you know the, the stock is skyrocketing. And the founder, uh, by the way, who uh, Trevor Milton, who's, who uh, was awarded a million shares as executive chairman, he just decided today to give all million of those shares to his employee base of 350 employees, okay? Now, your reaction to that, is, wow, exactly. Now, listen, Trevor Milton is gonna make a lot of money. He, he's gonna he do fine. Right. This is not, this is not gonna you know, send him into, you know, into bankruptcy. But what it did was it allowed him to give a large portion of equity in the form of options to a management team you know, to, to share in the upside. You, you might you might say that was awfully generous of him. You might also say it was actually, as Warren Buffett would say, very long-term greedy of him. Because if those options have, maybe I don't know what the terms are, but let's say they have a, a four or five-year vesting period and mm -hmm. those employees work extra hard because they're extra motivated because they've got all this upside. And as a result, over the next four or five years, the business grows even faster. Trevor Milton is going to do great as a result of that. Right. So. It amazes me how many companies that don't have institutional money in them don't create a broader shareholder base. And, you know, this is a classic example of a win-win. So, so, you know, be willing to do that, be willing to share, be willing to think about the long-term upside that, that flows from that. I think that's a really important part. Uh, that's really important for people to think about. Now, I don't know how common that, that is in, in, in the physical asset side, the mode side of the business, but from a tech standpoint, I would think that that's table stakes for someone to have that. I mean, if for you to get the best of the best to work at your company, they have to have some incentive, some skin in the game, some opportunity for upside along with you, right? Of Make course. everybody millionaires at, at least, right? Is not, that's not a bad policy um, or, you know, as close as you can get them reasonably, right? Yeah. And so when we invest, if, if the company doesn't already have a, you know, a, a generous option plan for management, we, we make sure that that's the case, you know, post investment, because it's long term in everybody's interest for that to be the case, shared, shared success. And, and again, it comes back to what does it mean to be a founder friendly fund? It means making sure that you are doing the things that help the management team win and, and win together. I got to say, if anything has stood out from for me from this this interview so far, it's your philosophies are there. They are truly beneficial to the companies and the founders that you invest with because it, if these things aren't known, they are certainly things that they should they should know and they should hear and they should hear from investors and that's not necessarily common. So, all right. So as we kind of wind this down, there's a couple of other questions I would love to have you share answers to with our, with our, uh, our audience. And, and one is I want to make sure that whatever you think our listeners ought to take away from this, they get to take away from this. So if there is one or two things that, that you want the listeners to take away from hearing about your journey or your philosophies, what, what are those? Well, Look, I think number one is don't give up. Sometimes when you're building something as a founder, uh, you get the door slammed in your face a lot. I remember when I started Threeplex, we went and took a, a trip to Silicon Valley. We went down Sand Hill Road calling on the venture capital firms, and we were rejected by all of them. <laughs> and we were not only rejected by those guys, but, but humiliated in, in, in one case in particular. I was pulling out of the parking lot of Sequoia and I got sideswiped by a woman in a Mercedes station wagon. And, and I just remember thinking, I, 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 I couldn't, I just couldn't process. I'm about to be late for my meeting with Kleiner Perkins because some woman sideswipes me and, and we're exchanging insurance information. 
And <laughs> it turns out that her last name is Byers. And I'm thinking, wait a second. I'm, I hope she doesn't hear this interview. Uh, <laughs> I realized that I'm about to be late to go pitch Kleiner, Perkins, Caulfield, and- And Byers. Byers, yes. Right. So, so uh, sure enough, the wife of, of the name partner, you know, Brooke Byers, is, is the woman with whom I'm exchanging insurance information. And uh, I'm just thinking, like, this is bad karma. Everything about this is bad. So <laughs> I end up, uh, and I'm, you know, dressed up because it's, it's, uh, this is 20 years ago and you were still supposed to dress up for, for pitch meetings. Right. So I've got my suit jacket on and I'm on the ground under the car, pulling the metal off the tire because otherwise the, the, the tire isn't going to spin. And I, I'm covered in grease. I'm disheveled. <laughs> I'm agitated. I show up late for the pitch meeting. You know, it went as about you would expect, which was terribly right. So <laughs> So I had a lot of whiffs, okay? But finally, I found an investor that was excited, and then the next one, the next one. And it's funny how it is. You know, when you're losing, you know, everything goes badly. And then all of a sudden, one win, and it's just here. It's the mindset that changes. And the next three, I'll, I'll submit a term sheets. And, uh, you know, I wasn't, I don't think I was as dumb as I felt I was that week in Silicon Valley. And I don't think I was as smart as I felt that week when we got our first term sheet and then everything else fell in, you know, in rapid succession behind that. And, and so to me, takeaway number one is don't give up. If you have an idea and, and it's a good idea, I mean, look, you can take this too far, right? I mean, if you have a bad idea, you shouldn't just ignore the market feedback. But right. if you have a good idea and you know that the elements of, of, of what, what you have uh, make sense, don't give up. Keep fighting. You know, you may have to pivot, you may have to adapt, you may have to make certain changes, but find a way to get through it. To me, that's that's number one. Number two is don't be afraid to take feedback. Don't be afraid to listen and make significant changes. You know, mm -hmm. for us, you know, I mean, look, Threeplex started out uh, as an exchange for shippers. One of the many dumb things that I did that I was at least able to recognize was the original name for the company was going to be Shippers Exchange. Well, if you put those words on the screen right now, what everybody will notice is it appears to say not shippers exchange, but shipper sex change. <laughs> so this was not what we had anticipated. Clearly. <laughs> but you know what? You look at it, you go, gee, that was probably a stupid idea. Let's change the name. We want to be execution software for three PLs. Let's call it threeplex. And and I'm not saying that was the world's greatest brand. Clearly it wasn't. But the point is, don't be afraid to make changes. Don't be afraid to adapt. Don't be afraid to recognize it's a sign of strength, not weakness, when, when you realize that, that your first idea wasn't as good as your second idea. And, and so, you know, again, that could be taken too far. You shouldn't be creating whiplash for your team by making massive changes every day. But, you know, don't, don't be afraid to rethink your assumptions and, and change your mind when you find a good reason to do so. And the third thing is, I've seen this so many times where people argue about the wrong things mm -hmm. and know, know what matters. I mean, you and I were talking about this earlier in the discussion where, you know, sometimes uh, a company thinks the right thing to do is sell and run an auction and, and that's it. And maybe that's the right thing to do. But you know what? Sometimes uh, having a partner for growth ultimately leads to your making more money. Would Coyote have built $1.8 billion of value if they didn't have Warburg come in? I don't think so. Uh, and even though Jeff Silver sold a big equity stake in the business to do so, uh, I think Jeff was was better off as a result. But there are lots of entrepreneurs in that position that would say, nope, not going to do that deal because I'm focused on control. Well, maybe that isn't the right thing to optimize for. Maybe if you have the opportunity to grow even faster with the right partner, maybe it's more important to ask, how do I get the right partner rather than how do I negotiate you know, the, the, the nickels, dimes, or, or even dollars when, when there's something much more important at stake. And yeah. I realized that could be, sound self-serving coming from a guy who's an investor who wants to pay a fair price, not a crazy price, but it has the added virtue of being true, which is in the end, the big decisions, you know, can make a money. If, if Brad Jacobs, for example, had optimized for buying the cheapest company he could buy, right? Maybe he would have bought a trucking company for three times EBITDA 
instead of an asset light logistics company for eight times EBITDA. And maybe as a result, instead of building a $16 billion company, he would have built a $1 billion company. He still would have done very well, right? But I, I think I know where, where I would have rather been. And, and yeah. I think that does too. So focus on the big stuff and, and, and make sure that you're spending your energy uh, on, on the, the thing that matters most, as opposed to getting bogged down in what might be in front of you, but maybe isn't as important. Those are great uh, pieces of advice. And I, I agree with you on every one of those points. And of course, there are dozens more that, that are meaningful, but those are really important. And I think really represent the discussion we've had here today. First of all, don't give up. Um, don't get too hung up on whether you're right or wrong either. Right. And lastly, a good partner is worth every penny. I mean, if you break it down into its simplest concepts. All right. So one final thing. Is there anything that we should have talked about that you think the audience should know or, um, you know, just any kind of parting shot that you want to you want to impart wisdom or knowledge or an anecdote, a sea story <laughs> uh, to the audience? Yeah, I think it was I think it was Emerson who said a uh, foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. And I love that line because what does it tell you? It tells you that a foolish consistency, meaning I'm going to do it this way because that's how other people do it. Mm. The hobgoblin of, of, of little minds is the mistake, the trap that people fall into. And it takes courage to think differently and to think bigger, but all the people that we celebrate as a, as an American society, you know, when Steve jobs had his ad campaign titled think different, mm -hmm. right. And, you know, Einstein and, and I mean, people who questioned the traditional assumptions uh, and, and ended up coming up with a radically different answer as a result, you know, like that's not just uh, those aren't just words in a, in a poem or, or words in a commercial that that really is what makes all the difference. You brought up Fred Smith earlier. Um, yeah. Had Fred Smith fallen prey to the foolish consistency. That's the hobgoblin of, of little minds. He would not have started FedEx. He would not have, he would have, you know, maybe he would have just gone and taken a job with, with another large company that was doing everything the way all the other, you know, companies of its type were. I mean, the trucking he industry. might've gone to work for the post office. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that was really the sort of concept that he rebelled against in that in that thesis, right? Exactly. Think of how much better our world is because Fred Smith didn't go take a job in the post office, but wrote a business plan that his teacher thought was terrible that he ended up building into an amazing success. Um, and so that has so many different ripple effects. One, if you are an entrepreneur and you have an idea, don't just do something that others are doing because that's what others are doing. Two, as an investor, don't just invest in an area as, as a me too. And three, if you are a founder looking for a capital partner, don't just say, oh, I'm gonna go with X because X is a big brand. Well, in the end, you're not taking money from a brand. You're taking money from a person who's gonna be on your board. And you want that person to be someone that understands your business in ways that you don't, and because otherwise, why do it? They should bring something that helps you. Um, and that's going to do something material that wouldn't otherwise make an impact on the business. Um, and it's going to care about it. And the, the lazy answer, the, the foolish consistency in the deal world is, well, I'm just going to go uh, do a deal with such and such, some large firm, because sort of the, the deal equivalent of nobody ever got fired for choosing IBM. Right. Well, but the truth of the matter is, and take it from me, there are a lot of great brands out there and I've had several of them as investors and, and as partners, but what mattered the most in the end wasn't the brand. It was the person on the other side of the deal. And if, if he or she was smarter than me and able to help me in material areas and committed to the success of, of the business, that's what made all the difference. Now, that's really the, the DNA for us as a firm, right? I mean, we all could have gone and joined, you know, some other large firm, large brand, um, but it isn't what we wanted to do. We wanted to build a business helping great entrepreneurs achieve great things. 
And we also wanted to give them the courage to be more aggressive and to bring them the resources to help them thrive and, and to help them succeed. And so my, my advice to those entrepreneurs who, who might be listening is don't be seduced by brand. Focus on what's the real value add and who's the real person on the other side of the table and what is he or she really going to do to help. And that's the right question to ask. And if you ask that question, you will inevitably end up with a better effort. Wow. That, uh, that's so, uh, that is so valuable. Trust your own judgment also on whether that person adds value. Of course, everyone is going to say that they can add value, but as a founder, as an executive, you know what you need and you need to extract whether that value exists in that person, in that firm, representative of that firm for you because that what you mentioned earlier, the complimentary gifts of that person who can shore you up on the finance side, if you're more of a salesperson or whatever that is, you need to recognize that first in yourself as an entrepreneur, and then you need to seek that out as counsel. You know, one, you know, one of the things that I think is critical for founders is mentorship and complimentary gifts. Great wisdom as usual. Usually I can really wrap these things up with a kind of a summary, but I feel like you've hit so much of it, Ben. I really appreciate it. So thank you for joining us. Um, I know I'll see you elsewhere, but thank you for joining us on Tequila Sunrise. I know the audience has gotten a lot out of this. I, I really, I really think this exemplifies why we need specialists, particularly in banking and particularly in investing in supply chain. It is so different and I'm glad that you're doing it. And I hope the best for you and your firm. And I know you've got more deals in, in your pocket that you can't tell us about. So keep us informed. Uh, real quick, how can folks connect with you? So they can reach me at ben at cambridgecapital.com. And that's probably the easiest and most direct way. I'm on LinkedIn. The handle is bengordon18. And I'm on Twitter. The handle is Benjamin H. Gordon. And I, I respond to most of my emails within 24 hours or less. So it's pretty so impressive. Feel free to, yeah, I, I, you know, it, it's uh, figure it's, it's Steve Jobs once said, he noticed that when he reached out to CEOs, he got a response within 10 minutes, um, VPs within two hours and, you know, associates within a day. And he asked the <laughs> question, you know, was it that they got to that position because they were responsive or they had the luxury of being responsive because they were in that position. They got to that position. Yeah. And I don't know which it is, but, but, you know, I, I think, I think you can, you can go crazy with that. I mean, there are days when you get 400 emails, but, uh, uh, but anyhow, I'm, I'm, I'm responsive on email and, and feel free to reach out. Thank you again, Ben Gordon with Cambridge Capital and BGSA, Ben Gordon Strategic Advisors, founder, managing partner, and You've heard it here from the master. So I really appreciate the time. Thank you, Ben. And just be aware, Ben is a growth equity and private equity investor. So if you just started a company, feel free to reach out to me. I'll get you to the right people. <laughs> All right. Thank thanks. Thanks a ton, man. I appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. Great being with you as always. Thanks for sharing your time with me and Ben. All right. That's all you need to know about supply chain tech for this week. But don't forget to get to supplychainnowradio.com for more Supply Chain Now series, interviews, and events. And now we have two live streams per week. The most popular live show in supply chain, Supply Chain Buzz, every Monday at noon Eastern time with Scott Luton, the master, and me. Plus, our Thursday live stream, to be named later, where we bring you eh, whatever the hell we want. Like a few weeks ago when we interviewed our producer Clay, the dog, Phillips. Thanks for spending your valuable time with me and remember, acknowledge reality, but never be bound by it.